You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast produced by Veteran Strategies and featuring conversations with fascinating and impactful men and women who have shaped our world, our communities, and our history. My name is Robert Vane, Principal of Veteran Strategies, and your host for our discussion. You are listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, an Indiana-based public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Girl Scouts of Central Indiana, Garmon Construction, Leaders and Legends LLC, the Grand Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and NFP, a national insurance broker with strong local content. Our podcast is featured on the All Indiana Podcast Network in partnership with Wish TV. You may find Leaders and Legends at allindianapodcastnetwork.com. Thinking of starting a podcast or need to host a public meeting? Let Leaders and Legends LLC be your partner as you look for new ways to communicate your message. Please contact Chris Spangle or me at leadersandlegends.net. And as always, all our podcast interviews are dedicated to the legacy and generosity of P.E. McAllister. Thank you for joining us on the Leaders and Legends podcast. Our guest today is Del Wilbur. He is the author of a magnificent account of the day that President Ronald Reagan was shot, and that's March 30th, 1981. The book is called Rawhide Down, The Near Assassination of Ronald Reagan. Dell is currently the Washington Investigations Editor for the Associated Press. And I need to give a quick shout out to my friend, AP reporter Brian Slodisco, who helped make this interview happen. Dell, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you very much for having me. You know, the Reagan near assassination obviously doesn't reach the heights of, of Bobby Kennedy, Jack Kennedy, or Martin Luther King, but it was a memorable day for many of us who were just old enough to remember. Where were you when you got the news that President Reagan had been shot? Um, you know, I don't even remember. I was six years old. And so I have no recollection of it actually happening. Um, I actually got the idea to write the book back in 2008, 2009. I was a reporter at the Washington Post and I was covering John Hinckley's hearings where he was trying to get more freedom from St. Elizabeth Hospital. And Hinckley, as we know, was con was found not guilty by reason of insanity for shooting Reagan and the other men that day, uh, March 30th, 1981. He was found not guilty by reason of insanity and went and spent his time at St. Elizabeth's. And as part of his later years, he was getting progressively more, progressively more and more freedom from that hospital institution, thanks to the diligent work of his lawyers. And I covered one of those hearings where they were debating the U.S. Attorney's Office, the prosecutors against um, Hinckley's attorneys um, were going back and forth on whether he should get more freedom or not. And I covered the hearing, and I remember this moment where I was like 10 feet or 15 feet from him, being like, wow, man, I'm, this this guy almost changed history, almost changed it, you know? Things have been a little different. So neat to be here covering this. And I remember him being a really weird guy. Like he like he had no facial expression. It was like as if he had been sleeping and someone had taken a cast of his face and then put it on him as a wake. You know, it was just so there was no emotion. In it, right. It was just like mm -hmm. a, a mask. And even when they were getting into like these detailed questions about his sex life, it, it was so interesting. And so, I'm like, OK, that's I wrote my stories. I thought it was kind of interesting. Almost. Again, remember, I said this, I thought it almost changed history. And, uh, you know, a few weeks later. I get summoned to the, the FBI's field office. And it's because I'm writing a story unrelated to Hinckley or anything. It was, I'd gotten a tip that Ethiopian taxi cab drivers in the district were bribing DC officials to get licenses and stuff. And I'd heard about it in the, in the US Attorney's Office and FBI had had a Title III wiretap on them. They didn't want it out. And so I got summoned by Joe Persicini, who is the head of the FBI office, to come talk me out of writing a story. And I get summoned there. And he's like, you can't write the story. You'll hurt our case and we need to build the investigation. Da, da, da. And I was like, you know, I had so much going on. And frankly, people bribing D.C. officials at that time, this was like 2009, 
it was 2008, 2009, that time frame. That's kind of like a dog bites man story, you know, <laughs> not that surprising. And so I was like, okay, you know, I have so much other stuff to do anyway. You know, I don't quite have the whole story. If you give it to me first or we can arrange something like that, I'll, I'll, I will hold off. He, and as we're negotiating this, he gets up from the conference table, goes over to his desk. And I hear him rummage through a drawer and he comes over and slaps this heavy thing in my hand. I look down, it's a gun. And I'm like, wow, you really don't want me to write this story to you, right? <laughs> that's a message. And he goes, that's Hinckley's gun. I'm like, John Hinckley's gun is in your desk drawer? I, mean, I don't know if you've been to D.C., but you can walk around anywhere in D.C. and you bump into a museum that would love that artifact. Absolutely. It's your desk drawer. And what had happened was they'd had a, a museum in that field office and it had closed after 9-11. And like that became like one of his little conversation starters in his office. And he'd kept it in his desk drawer. And I just thought that was such an interesting thing. I left that meeting. I go, wow, man, I now had two run-ins with this story. I've touched Hinckley's gun, and I've seen Hinckley in court. And I'm doing all this stuff. I wonder if anyone's written a book on it. So I went to the library. And no one had written a book on this day. And so then I went and interviewed um, Jerry Parr, the lead Secret Service agent who saved Reagan's life, I learned, not once but twice. And I interviewed the doctors who helped save Reagan's life. And I interviewed some more. And I started piecing together this idea. I'm going to write this book on this. And in doing that, I learned something totally counterfactual to what I thought when I first saw Hinckley was that Hinckley, this shooting did change history, right? It, it, it made history like almost as much as if Reagan had been killed and that it changed Reagan's outlook on the presidency. It changed Reagan's outlook on life. It changed the entire direction of his administration in some ways and his dealings with Russia and nuclear weapons and all these things. And the fact that Reagan's life was spared and he, he was spared with this kind of thing. He'd been spared by God himself that that allowed him to change America and change the world. And the world would be different if he, the world is different because this incident happened and it, it endeared Reagan to the American people who, which we can get into, who kind of fell in love with his bravery that day to the point where scandals that would have taken down another presidency did not take down Reagan because he had had this bond with the American people. And so that's where bravery. I got the idea and I, wrote, and I wrote the book and it was published in 2011. Bravery and, and whimsy. We'll mm -hmm. talk about that here in a few minutes. You mentioned him a couple of times already. Uh, he is he is to me a, a loathsome figure. But take a few minutes, please, and tell the Leaders and Legends podcast audience about John Hinckley. Yeah, so John Hinckley um, was a kind of, was a very troubled young man. On um, this day, he's twenty five. March thirtieth, nineteen was twenty five, and um, he's living in Colorado, but he had grown up in Texas. Um, you know, kind of a never been very good at anything, didn't have a lot of friends, clearly had some mental illness going on. Um, he thought he wanted to be a songwriter. Um, and, and he spent a lot of time time in L.A. trying to be a songwriter and didn't really do very much on that. Like, didn't make any progress, just went and lived there and didn't do anything. And while there, he becomes obsessed uh, with Jodie Foster, the actress, watching Taxi, uh, Taxi Driver. With Robert De Niro, that movie, he watched it something like more than 25 times. Now, this is obviously before you had DVDs and and video cassettes, even like VHS sets or Betamax. I think he was going to the movies. You have to go to the movie. If you want to see a movie again, you have to go to the movie theater. Right? <laughs> and so he went 26 times or something, huge number. It's in the book, um, in which to see her, and he became obsessed. And he's growing pr progressively as the late 70s and the early 80s are happening. He becomes progressively more and more down in his luck, more and more depressed, um, uh, you know, it, with other psychosis. And I forget the precise definition of the psychosis he would later be have. Is it, is it erotomania? Is that what he was no, diagnosed with? No, it was something like schizophrenic, but not schizophrenia. It's like a it's in the book. I wish I, again, like you have to read your book once a year, remember <laughs> all the details and I haven't read it in a couple of years. So like he, and so he, he has these issues, but he, he, he gets fixated on Jay Foster. He's like, you know, I'm going to impress her. And the best way I impress her is to get the president of the United States. So he starts stalk, stalking Jimmy Carter. And during the 1980 presidential campaign, Carter goes to Dayton, Ohio, and Hinckley follows him there. And he gets within arm's length of Carter at an event. And with an arm length, he may have even shaken his hand. And but he left his guns at the bus depot in a locker. So he doesn't shoot Carter. 
Then there's another moment where he's close to getting Carter in Nashville, Tennessee. And he's leave, he sides against it. And he's leaving, he's leaving Nashville to fly to Connecticut to be closer to Jody Foster, who had left Hollywood to go to school at Yale. And so he wants to get close to Foster. And he's actually caught at the airport. They find the gun in his luggage and they seize it and like find him $75 or whatever. And he's let off the hook. And so he's in his mind now, he's like, I got to get the president to impress Foster. Fast forward to March 1981. It's no longer his mind is now I'm not going to get Foster. I'm not going to get the president. I'm actually what I'm going to do is go to Yale. He's in L.A. He'd gone to L.A. one last time, trying to make a song order, obviously failed, hops in a Greyhound bus, goes across the country to get to Connecticut. He wants to get to Yale where he is going to shoot Foster, shoot Foster, then himself or just kill himself in front of Foster. He hadn't quite worked it all out yet. And the bus stops in D.C. It's like a layover. and. He gets an overnight hotel and he's ready to go back to the train, the bus station the next day to go to Connecticut to carry out his plan. When he picks up the Washington Star newspaper and sees that the president is giving a speech at the Washington Hilton Hotel at 2 p.m. And that's when his plans changed. He was no longer going to get Foster. He still might, actually. He's, gonna, he's In his mind, he's like, I'm going to, oh, the president's speech. I'm going to see how close I can get. I'm going to see how close I can get to, to Reagan at, at the hotel. And, and I believe that Hinckley also stalked Reagan. He tried. It was just so much more difficult. But he was in D.C. for the inauguration, too, mm. Reagan's inauguration. But the security was so much tighter around that. He was not getting close to him. Much like uh, John Wilkes Booth watching Abraham Lincoln give the second inaugural in April in oh, yeah. March of 65. Good memory. Uh, yep. Let's talk about the Secret Service. Uh, obviously, November 22nd, 1963 was probably their worst day. Uh, the Leaders and Legends podcast was lucky enough to have a long interview with Clint Hill. He was terrific. His books are amazing. Uh, then you had uh, Martin Luther King in, in April of 68, which isn't their fault, but Robert Kennedy, June of 68. Then, and people kind of forget, you had George Wallace a few years later. Then you had, I think, is it 75 when the two attempts were made on Ford's life by Sarah Jane squeaky. Moore and, and squeaky. Manson Mansonette squeaky from squeaky from. So you haven't had all, you haven't had any shootings of the president, but you've had maybe some near misses. How did the secret service change after the Kennedy assassination and what led them to create the perimeter system that you detail in your book and on these documentaries I've been watching. So secret service, like what, was not prepared for Kennedy. Um, they did very little training in the 50s and 60s. Like they go to the they go to the firearms range maybe once or twice a year. They didn't really learn a lot of the kind of the advanced techniques that were emerging on how to protect people. Right? If you watch the the Zapruder film, you'll see like the limousine driver takes no evasive action at all when almost everyone recognizes it as gunshots. Right? Just motoring along. Um, and so <clears throat> then you have, like you mentioned, you have Robert Kennedy, Martin Luther King. And don't forget, around the world, there are a bunch of political assassinations at this time. Yeah. Then, then you have Wallace in 1971, right? Or 72? 72, I thought he was. 72, uh, in Laurel, Maryland, the, right? The shopping center, parking lot. Well, in and the Secret Service bungled that, right? So. They allowed Wallace to walk up a rope line and back down a rope line. You never, ever let a principal walk up and back down because coming back down, you're giving the person who may have like freaked out, steal their nerves to do it again. And that's what happens. You know, um, I'm, uh, what's his name who did it? Um, Arthur Bremer. Arthur Bremer. God, man, I'm just tired. I have a new baby at home. So it's like my my brain is also mush. I have baby brain. Congratulations. So Arthur Bremer, Congratulations. Arthur, oh, thank you. And Arthur Bremer launches, you know, starts shooting and he hits Wallace, paralyzes him. And the agents like like stand over his body as his wife covers the body, not them. Like they froze, right? So they had yeah. not been tra trained to react with kind of without thinking. So around this period, this a rogue, kind of a rogue element of the Secret Service in LA is like, you know. We really got to step up our training game. This world is going to pot. Like we need to be ready for this. And they launch an intense 
training course in LA with the LA SWAT team where they're like jumping out of helicopters, like live action fire, real firearms, like a lot of sprained ankles, broken bones doing this kind of training, like speaking out of podium and covering, getting them out, like doing it over and over and over again to the point they're called attack on principle drills, AOPs, mm. to the point where they were trying to train everyone to react without thinking, right? That was the goal. And so eventually the Secret Service adopts that kind of intense training while also doing a course called 10-Minute Medicine, and where they didn't teach you medicine in 10 minutes, but the, the idea was to keep your person alive for 10 minutes until you get them medical help. Those two things, as well as the advancement in trauma care at GW Hospital specifically, but also across the country, those are the two reasons that Reagan lived that day. If the, the Secret Service didn't step up its training and and the hospital hadn't taken steps to also have better trauma care that worked with with everyone doing a job without having to be told to do it, Reagan dies. Reagan is at the Washington Hilton to give a speech, and he walks out from giving this speech, and he walks right out into like almost a turnaround area, for lack of a better term, um, that has been changed considerably. And I want to ask you about that just right now is before we get into the actual events of the day, how did the training of the Secret Service and their procedures change after this event in March of 81? Oh, I mean, after this event, um, you know, you you never, ever really see in uncontrolled environments a president get in and out of a vehicle. Like they're always in the Kevlar tents now or they're in garages. You rarely see that. Also, the main one of the main problems with this day was people will see if you watch you go to YouTube and you watch shooting videos, you'll see there are a bunch of reporters and regular people staying behind a rope line. That was an unscreened rope line. Right. You didn't have to go through a magnetometer to be behind that rope line. Now, no one gets near the president unless you've been mag gone through a magnetometer. Right. And so the idea that they had people 15 feet from the president who were not screened is a total bungling of the day. But the agents like Jerry Parra told me it was like their best day and worst day because um, they had pulled like they had gone to Hilton 110 times over the last like 15 years. And they just kept pulling the same game plan out and use the same game plan each time. He's like, if this had been in Baltimore or Boston or New York, or we went to New York a lot, or Miami, that rope line would not have been there. That rope line would have been like 40 yards back. But that's where it always was at the Hilton. And so we just left it at there at the Hilton. We didn't think to move it. And so that's where Hinckley was waiting for him. But and it's now, now that does not happen. Like you haven't had a credible... There hasn't been a credible assassination attempt on the president in many, many, many years, unless you count the dude who threw shoes at Bush at a press conference. And, and, and in Georgia, the country, someone lobbed a dead grenade that landed near him. That was kind of freaking scary. Um, and, you know, you've had instances where, like, you know, the guy got 36 feet into the White House, but he was never going to get close to the president. So, like there have been stuff like that, but there's been no no real. And like I would like shoot up the White House. Remember with an assault rifle yeah. or something in the '90s. Another guy crashed a plane. Crash, I think the plane crashed. Plane, right? Yeah. And so like there's always been that, but it just it's they've made it so much harder. You know. When you talk about the videos and some of the still pictures, as you were going through those for your book, which ones did you find the most chilling? Because the day is incredibly well documented. I mean, unlike the Kennedy, you know, Clint Hill said on our podcast that Oswald had every advantage, like he had every advantage over the Secret Service. And without the Zapruder film, who knows how we could have reconstructed it. But but the Reagan assassination attempt, you have diagrams and still pictures and you had TV cameras there. So it was just a completely different. And the atmosphere. Associated Press won a Pulitzer Prize winning picture for the picture of Parr throwing the agent throwing Reagan in the limo. And so how long had the photographer been working for the AP? <laughs> yep. I've been working for AP. No. Yeah. How long had the photographer been working when he got these pictures? I, I think a while. He was a long time AP guy. Yeah. Really nice guy. Um, anyway, so like, I think that all is, it, it is, it was so documented. So like, I guess you're asking me like what sticks with me the most. I didn't know what's funny is the picture that stuck with me the most 
was not from the scene. It was I was at the Reagan Library going through pictures that their photographers took that day behind closed doors. And there was one in Bush's office where Bush, Weinberger, he was the defense secretary, Meese, Reagan's counselor, um, and a couple other. Oh, and Fred Fielding, the White House counsel, were meeting. And you just see the look on their faces in that one moment where the weight of the world is on them. The presidents in the ICU are in recovery room. And a lot of, you know, he's he's going to live, but like, you know, he's been shot and they're they look completely fatigued. It was like the worst day they'd ever had. And that's what's that's the picture that sticks with me. I can send it to you if you remind me. Oh, please it's, do. It's a, it's a great picture. And then there's the picture taken by I think it's at the White House photographer where you can see Hinckley staring in the direction uh, where the president's coming. Oh, oh, yeah, that was um that was taken by the 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 director of security at the um, at the Hilton. I think Al Fury took that picture. And before, it was like an hour before. And there's Hinkley just staring there. Like, sometimes it helps, like, when you're talking about the day, like, just to to take it, you like, to understand, like, why the day was so significant as to take you through how it happened. Um, but I, I don't know if when you want me to do that. Right now, I'm going to thank our sponsors real quick. You are listening to the Leaders and Legends podcast. It's presented by Veteran Strategies, an Indiana-based public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Garmon Construction, Leaders and Legends LLC, the Grand Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and NFP, a national insurance broker with strong local content. Our guest today is... Del Wilbur, the author of a terrific book called Rawhide Down, The Near Assassination of Ronald Reagan. It takes you through everything. It's wonderfully written. We're lucky to have him on the podcast today. So President Reagan is finished with his speech, and he is walking to his car. Take it from there. Uh, <laughs> I'm going to interject just one real quick thing. that this The report I did for this book like still benefits me today in telling stories in that you know, Trump was just arraigned in New York, right? right? And so there were a lot of questions, how the Secret Service was handled it. They'd never done this before, whatever. But I remembered in my interview, Jerry Parr is like the hero of this day. He was the head of Reagan's detail. Jerry Parr drove Spiro Agnew to to plea, enter a plea in Baltimore and then resign from office. Oh, you're kidding me. No low contendra. Yeah. yeah, no, yep. The no contest plea, right? And so... um he would, and so I went through my notes and I found this crazy story that Jerry told me that wasn't relevant to the Reagan assassination attempt or anything. But Jerry and the lead agent had conspired, agreed that they would not tell anyone, even their bosses, that this guilty or not guilty, but this no contest plea and resignation were going down at all because Agnew asked them not to. So they kept it a complete secret, even from their own bosses. They go all the way to Baltimore, all this happens, and Jerry starts getting yelled at by his bosses when he's in the car finally driving Agnew away from the from the courthouse you know Agnew had like like took like $147,000 in kickbacks as the Maryland yeah. governor and didn't report his taxes so he was in a lot of trouble but he um like Ray, like in part like started getting yelled at by his bosses because by not telling their bosses their bosses were caught flat-footed and were not able to go rush protection to the speaker of the house who was next in line for the presidency and so there was a gap in protection of the the person, like if Nixon was killed, and they also got the House Speaker at that same time, like you're you're going way down the line of presidential succession, then, right? Yeah. And so they were really mad at Jerry for keeping it secret, but Agnew didn't want the press to know. And so I did a fun story about that, like going through my old notes with Jerry Parr, <laughs> and like he's like the Forrest Gump of the Secret Service. He's had all these historic moments, you know. Agnew um, and his friends in the press. Yes. Oh, yeah. The nattering the bobs of negativism. Although he wasn't talking <laughs> to the press. That was the Democrat. All right, so that day, March 30th, 1981, 70 days into Reagan's first term, very early on, um, Reagan has to give a speech. Um, what I found interesting about this is that Reagan actually really, it's a throwaway speech, the AFL-CIO's Building Constructions Trades Department. It's like a presidents give these speeches all the time. He's going to the Hilton, the Washington Hilton to do it. The Washington Hilton's this huge hotel up on um, Connecticut Avenue. And it's like designed so all the windows like can face downtown. And they th to be a good hotel in D.C., you really have to have a huge ballroom to it. And you have to have a special like to get the president there. Right. You want the president to come to speak to groups there, these conventions. 
And so they had a special entrance just for the president. Anyway, so I set that up. So Reagan's giving this speech. And what's really interesting to me is that Reagan actually really cared about this speech, like most presidents probably wouldn't have. He rewrote the whole speech by hand that weekend before. This was a Monday. So he rewrote that whole speech by hand the weekend before because, you know, he was a AFL-CIO card-carrying member when he was on the president of the Screen Actors Guild. And so he he really cared about this speech. It meant a lot to him. You know, so he he rewrote it. And he was a good writer. I, I thought his, he made the speech much better. Um, and he goes to deliver the speech. It's at 2 p.m. You know, the the limp, the 15 car motorcade gets up there. They drop him off at the T Street entrance. And so um, they drop him off the T Street entrance. He goes in, delivers a speech. 25 minutes later, it's time to leave. Now, what's interesting is they built this whole part of the hotel, this entrance of the hotel, just to get the president. And it's like a really cool entrance. Like there's an elevator and a spiral staircase, and it goes right into a secure green room, which is like the safe room. It's like mm-hmm. if something bad happened there. You put them in there. It's like reinforced concrete, all this stuff. And so, but when they designed it, they poorly designed it. And so like there's a winding, You, if you drop someone off and you always drop the president off the right rear passenger side, you pick them up with the right rear passenger side of the car. And by doing that, they couldn't just leave the car there and drive up the driveway. There's a winding driveway that gets up to Connecticut Avenue. And they realized that the driveway was too narrow for the beast, <laughs> the limousine. And they worried if they took it up there, it might get stuck in the crossfire if they were attacked. Right. So they didn't think they could safely navigate the limousine up this tiny little driveway all the way up to exit. So their solution was they back the car, they drop the prison off and then back the car up about 30 feet from the entrance, angle it out towards T Street. So the president had to walk out in the open for a bit to get to the car. Right. Meanwhile, about 15 feet from the open waiting door of the car is a rope line. That rope line was put there to hold back the press and members of the public. It was not a press line. It was just there to hold it. But like guys like Sam Donaldson were there hoping to hurl a question that Reagan might answer. It was crowded back there. Little does everyone know that John Hinckley's there, as we already talked about. He's there waiting for the president. He has this tiny little 22 mil, 22 caliber gun in his hand. Um, little six shooter. And he's, you know, waiting for the president. He says he's thinking, I'm going to get him and then they're going to kill me. But I'll at least impress Jody Foster back at the hotel where he'd been staying. He left a note for Foster. Even and so he's doing this to Jody. Reagan comes out at 227 p.m. walking straight towards the car. When gunshots erupt, Hinckley has taken aim at the president. And the first shot hits um, Jim Brady in the head. Jim Brady's facing away. Shoots, hits Jim Brady in the head. The second shot hits Tom Delahanty, a D.C. police officer, in the back. That all happens in like four tenths of a second. Jerry Parr is already reacting. His brain is processing like the gunshots before like he can really even understand what he's hearing. And if you watch the video, he's grabbing and shoving Reagan towards that open limousine door. This was a they called them suicide doors because they opened in reverse. They opened backwards. Right. So the door, the car is pointing away from Hinckley. But the door is like facing him. So he gets Reagan behind that door. The third shot goes high and hits a building across the street. And that's because Hinckley had taken a lot of target practice in the weeks before this, but he'd never shot at moving targets. So he's tracking the president from right to left. He shoots Brady. He hits, he hits Delahanty in the back, hits, shoots high, hits the window across the street, levels down and hits the window of the lim- armored window of the limousine as Reagan and Parr flash behind it. The, no, I'm sorry, the the third shot, actually. So the third shot goes high. The right. fourth shot, it's Tim McCarthy in the chest, right, in the abdomen. He's a, he's, a, he's a Secret Service agent. He had taken a blocking stance and throws himself without a bulletproof vest to take a bullet for the president. The fifth shot hits the window, right, as they're flashing behind it into the car. And the sixth shot, they hear it crack across this, like, area, driveway. No one knows where it goes. They don't know till later that it slapped the side of the limousine, slipped through a gap an inch and a half wide between the door and the door frame, smashed into the shape of a dime, hit the president edgewise about five inches below his left armpit, and then tumbled through his chest. Right. But like that doesn't leave any. There's no blood coming out because it was like a, a it hit him like just edgewise and got into. Him. They land in the car. They slam the door. 
like the, the scene is going crazy. People are screaming and yelling. Um, you can even hear a little bit later, Jerry Parr's wife, the agent's wife, running out of the building across the street where she worked, asking the status of her husband. Where's my husband? Where's my husband? You know, it's a crazy scene. Mm. They can't hear any of that in the armored limousine. The, the armor is so thick. It's so quiet. They're just in there and they're hauling ass away. Drew and Rue, the driver of the of the limousine, is praying to God he doesn't run over his good friend, Tim McCarthy, because he saw him get shot and land. He has no choice, though. This limousine weighs something like 13,000 pounds. It will crush. It will crush McCarthy. And that's a great point. Yeah, you right? didn't know what you're doing. But he, he's not. He slams on the gas and takes off. They're peeling out. They take off. And I don't know if you've ever seen a presidential motorcade. They're really long. Right. And in this instance, when that car takes off and turns down Connecticut Avenue, it's a motorcade of one. The only two people protecting the president at that moment are Jerry Parr and Drew. And Drew. That's it. They left the motorcade behind. That limo is taken off. And they don't know if this is an isolated incident. Is it a larger conspiracy? Know. They don't know and any so, of this. Nope. And so Jerry Parr wants to check out Reagan, see how Reagan's doing. He props him up in the seat and runs his hands over him, checks his body. No blood anywhere. Are you okay? And Reagan's like, yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. You know, I think you hurt my back when you threw me in the car, though, Jerry. He snapped at him, didn't he? Like, he did. yeah. He was, Jerry, he was I think little, you broke my rib. Yeah, he was really pissed, right? <laughs> and so, um, and so, like, yeah, he's like, he growled at par, right? And, and, but, like, that's not, um, and, at first, though, he's OK. That that comes a few seconds later. They're taken off down Connecticut. They're all alone. Eventually, the backup limousine gets in front of them and the follow up car at the agents gets behind them. And in the back of the car, pa- uh, Parr um, notices that Reagan like is, is not doing he's, he doesn't see me as feeling. So like, now is when he's like, oh, I, I hurt my rib when you threw me in here, man. Ow, Jerry, my back, my rib mm-hmm. and my side. And he takes a napkin out of his right coat pocket that he takes from the hotel and dabs his lips. And there's blood on it. And Parr looks closely at it and realizes it's not like Reagan's like, I think I cut my mouth. But Parr looks at it, it's very bright and frothy blood, which means it's from the lungs. He learned this in the 10 minute medicine course. That's very bad. So Parr thinks, oh, shit. I threw this guy in the limousine and we landed on that hump. You know, it's not the axle hump, I guess. Or is that the axle the hump? The old drive chain hump? Drive the drive, yeah, right? Yeah, drive train hump. Bam, lands on that. And I broke his rib and it, it punctured a lung. So Parr has already said, we're going back to Crown. He on the radio is, we're going back to Crown, which is, or the driver did, which is the White House, the code name for the White House. But now he has a decision to make. You know, president's complaining of pain in his side. He has bright, frothy blood. You know, this doesn't look good. I have a choice. I can either go back to the White House where we have a good medical facility. You know, maybe it's not that serious. But if I did puncture a lung, man, like, I don't know. We should go to the hospital. Now, if he's the wrong, White House is secure, but the hospital is not. They don't even have an agent. That now, now, one of the lessons they learned is now when the president visits any city, there, there are Secret Service agents stationed at the hospitals he might have to go to. Mm-hmm. Right? They didn't do that then. There was actually, by chance, like an administrative guy from the Secret Service at the hospital when this happened, but he wasn't like an agent. And so Parr has this decision to make. And like, if he's wrong, like he could kill the stock market, racing the president to a hospital if nothing's wrong, right? He's in, that's in his mind. And so Jerry decides, I'm going to take him to the hospital. We got to go, you know? And, me- and meanwhile, Drew and Rue, the driver, is like gunning it, and he almost ran over a woman pushing a stroller. Right across the street, who was trying, like, you know, the street was closed and the woman was trying to beat traffic across the street, I guess. He had to dodge a stroller. It was like out of a movie, you know. And <laughs> and so he's like, oh, we're going to the hospital. And he gets on um, and and he gets he gets on Rue to tell him we're going to the hospital. And um, and, and Rue's like, we want to go to the emergency room at George Washington Hospital and that and 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 go and and he's like, and Rue's like, we gotta get there fast. And then Parr grabs the radio from him and is like, you know, we need a stretcher out there. Like, let's hustle. We need a stretcher at the hospital. And they get there in three minutes from the time of the shooting to the time they get pull up to the door of the hospital. They get there in three minutes. And they get there in three minutes and they pull up. And, and Reagan insists on getting out of the limousine without any help and walking on his own power. And he like hitches up his pants in a way like Reagan would, you know, like a cowboy and walks in. 
And, and Parr's like, all right, he wants to be a cowboy. He can be a cowboy, I guess. And he, they walk in, they get about 15, 20 feet into the emergency entrance, and they pass a paramedic who was there for an unrelated thing. And I interviewed the paramedic, and he's like, I saw the president walk right by me. Oh, my God. I saw his face was ashen. I saw his eyes roll in the back of his head, and then he collapsed. And I thought, oh, my God, the president's code city, meaning he's going to die, right? Code out. Dead. <laughs> code city. And, and so they, they grabbed the president, and they raced him to a trauma bay, put him on the trauma bay, and the, the nurses cut off cut off Reagan's pants and clothes, his new suit, brand new suit given by Nancy Reagan. Not smart to piss her off, but they cut off the suit, cut it off. And they're all kind of panicking some. The nurse, a nurse is trying to get his blood pressure and can't. It's so low. He's in shock. She can't get his blood pressure. And she starts to cry because she thinks back to the one time she saw her father cry, which was November 22nd, 1963, watching the news reports of the Kennedy assassination. Mm. She's like, I'm now here for one. But they're all doing their job still, even though it's like really difficult. And one woman, a technician, th threads a. Um, and they all think, by the way, they're all think he's a goner. A lot, like they can't get his blood pressure. He's clearly distressed. Maybe he's having a heart attack. They don't know what's wrong with him. Broke a rib, had a heart attack. It's a disaster. He looks terrible. He's ashen. And one threads a, a IV line from his right arm all the way to his heart. And only then does she look up. She was so zoned in on her job. Only then does she look up and see what are these dudes with guns and earpieces and standing over and looks down at rings. Oh, my God, it's the president. She freaks out and goes, gets smelling salts off the off the wall, but not for him, but for her. So she does the smelling <laughs> salts like to get herself back into focus, right? And that's about when like they're trying to assess him. And doctors come down and like, let's see how he's doing. And so like the left side, the right side of his chest, it, it sounds like a, a drum, right? Like right, like hollow, meaning there's air there. The left side, when they do that same thing, it's it's like solid, which means it's all filled with blood, right? So they know something really bad has happened there. And that's when like a surgical intern shows up and looks and sees a little slit in Reagan's eyes. Oh, he was been shot. And they all look down and realize he'd been shot. And there's all this blood collecting. And so they they at this point, this was maybe five minutes in, they had stabilized and they they injected him with lots of IV fluids. They got they, they finally detected his blood pressure. And got that up. So they've stabilized him with fluids and and they, they're getting his blood pressure up. But they realize he's been shot. And like, there's a lot of that's solid. That's not good. He has a lot of internal bleeding. And it's not coming out because there's like just a tiny little slit. And so they they jam a a chest tube into his side between two ribs to drain the blood. And what's really interesting on this day, Reagan would lose more than half his blood, his blood volume. Wow. And they come to realize they take an X-ray and they come to realize the bullet is an inch from Reagan's heart. So he lost more than half. He was in shock, lost more than half his blood volume. The bullet's an inch from his heart. And, you know, they take him into surgery. And this is kind I know, of I know, by the way, he's 70 years old. He's 70 years old, but in great like, shape. The, the surgeons all said he's like a 50 year old. Right. They were like. They, he's in great shape, kept really good care of himself. And that's the reason he lived too, right? Mm -hmm. Like if he had been like William Howard Taft, he's dead. <laughs> right? Like, you know, some poor uh, Taft, right? You know, big fat guy, right? <laughs> and so, like, you know, they and so they take him, and this is where the myth of Reagan comes up, right? Like, so when he's on the emergency room table, and this is what I thought was so interesting about Reagan, he's on the emer the trauma bay table, right? And before I get to that, just like one reason Reagan lives is all these doctors, nurses had stuff to do. They treat them like any other patient and they didn't ask for any directions. Someone's been hurt. Their blood pressure is low. We get them fluids. We get that blood pressure up. We stabilize them. We all have a little role to play. And they got that from Shock Trauma Center in Maryland uh, just in the few years before. So if this was like he, if he had somehow beaten Ford and then beaten Carter and this was 1977, he's dead. Because they would have been too slow to save him, right? So it had advanced that much by 1981. Now, this is the myth of Reagan, right? So Reagan's on the table, and he looks up at Jerry Parr, and he goes, he looks at Parr and says, Jerry, I hope they're all Republicans. And now Parr's going out of his freaking mind, 
right? Like, oh my God, I'm the head of the detail. The president's been shot. My <laughs> career is trouble. I am deep trouble. Oh my God. And you're cracking a joke. What is like, he's like, what is not funny, man. Stop. No one else really hears it except a technician who I interviewed. Reagan knows the line fell flat. He's like, you know, it's kind of funny. He puts it in his back pocket. He gets wheeled to the operating room. They decide they probably, normally they would not operate to remove a bullet from anybody. It's not worth it. They usually just leave them in. But one, they didn't want to leave a bullet in the president. But two, the bleeding won't stop. So they have to go in any way to try to stop the bleeding. And to do, to stop the bleeding, they think they have to go and stop the bleeding, make sure he doesn't have a peritoneal tear with blood forming in his belly. And so they're going to go in and get the bullet out of him. They wheel him up and he passes, he passes the Troika, Baker, Meese, and Deaver. His three top advisors are sitting there just watching him get wheeled away. And he stops. He goes, who's minding the store? Right? To him, right? Like, <laughs> well, you guys are supposed to be at the White House, man. What are you doing here? Right? We'll, we'll get we'll get to General Haig here in a second. Yeah, right? Yeah, no, right? General Haig. And then they get to the operating room. And he's in the operating room. And he's on the table. And that's where he reprises that, that funny line where he's, he gets up dramatically on elbow. Because he could tell... Everyone around him is really stressed, like operating on the president of the United States who has a chest wound an inch from the heart. It's a very stressful thing. Like you screw that up and like you're going to be labeled the doctor who killed the president. Right. So like he gets up on an elbow and just looks at him and says, I hope you're all Republicans and lays back down. Right. As a joke. And everyone laughs and they all laugh. They, it's like took the tension right out. And this one surgeon looks at him and says, today, Mr. President, we're all Republicans, even though he's a diehard liberal. I was like, we're together with you. Don't worry. We're not letting you die. And and I'm like, oh, that's, you know, Reagan, man, that's that's really impressive. You know, like those two line, two lines right there like that, you know, that's pretty good. And I went, wait a minute. Let me ask you about another line just real quick. That's uh-huh. six years hence. Uh, are you familiar? I'm sure you are with the video of, of him speaking in Berlin and the balloon popping. No. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll send it to you. So okay. he's speaking in, in Berlin. I think it's 1987 and he's in the middle of a sentence and there's a balloon that pops in the background and in front of 50,000 people, president Reagan just says, missed me. Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, yeah, I do remember that. It's pretty funny. <laughs> you, not, 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 but, but like in this instance, so you're Reagan, you know, he was a big movie guy. He's starting like 50 movies give or take one or two, I guess. And what were his two most famous roles in his two best movies? Well, he was, um, where's the rest of me in from King's, King's Row. Row. Yeah. And well, he did place, he did, he did share the screen with Errol Flynn, Hellcats of the Navy. Oh no, no, no. Uh, uh, Newt Rockney, all American. Yes. And what was that? His best scene in that? Go win the one Gip- for the Gipper. Give one for the Gipper. Yeah. And what were those when two? The brakes are, when the brakes are beating the boys. Yeah. So those two scenes were hospital like deathbed scenes and his two best movies. The guy knew what he was doing. Like he went right back. He knew the world was a stage, man. He did that on purpose. He knew the world would get word would get out that he was like cracking jokes in the face of death. Right. Like they knew he knew. And so all that experience played a role right there. Right. And that's what like when when stuff like that got out and the jokes he was trading with the nurses later. You know, all in all, I'd rather be in Philadelphia. Send me to L.A. where I could, the air I could see the air I'm breathing. Can we shoot that scene over again from the hotel? <laughs> right? all those, he knows those are going to get out, right? And they're going to get out. And, like, you know, I don't know if he knows this, but, like, what happens after this, He obviously he lives. The doctors go in. They find the bullet, take it out, an inch from his heart. Um, there are a lot of tense moments during the surgery. They almost give up. They can't find it. Um, but, like. What happens after this is like he forms a bond with the American public. Like it was more than just like an old man was hurt or your uncle was hurt. Like people wanted a leader who laughed in the face of death. Right. And like you and they wanted someone who they want. They, Reagan always was dogged by authenticity questions. Like, is he really that funny? Was he reading from a script? Like, do you have any original thoughts? And and the one time, the one time and place you really can't fake it when like you're shot in your death. Right. <laughs> that, that was very revealing on who he was right at that moment. And so the American people saw that the press saw it and they, it, they formed a bond over it. Like his approval rating would go up and down. But the, the fact that he formed this bond with the public did not. And David Broder told me he was a very astute political writer. Oh, yeah. Just before he died, it was like this. This formed a bond with the American people that never broke. And like it saved him from like impeachment during a ran contract like this one day. Like it just it was. It just formed this bond with the American people. 
And so like that allowed Because him- to your point, you said a point earlier, I think we would have started and it's in your book. And it's again, it's in these documentaries that you can find on YouTube. That's a brilliant one that's on C-SPAN 3, where uh, Dell takes you through the day, quite frankly, on location. Uh, I, am I wrong in remembering that there was like some editor of a school newspaper or something who wrote that he hoped Reagan would die from his wounds? And there was a he was not this universally beloved figure, even though he won oh. 489 to 49 against Carter in 1980. Well, no, I he was not like I think, you know, there were obviously people who the, the country wasn't quite as polarized then as it is now. Right. Like if something happens to Trump or Biden, I'm sure there's a large segment of the population that would be that may. I, I don't know how large, but not an insignificant number of people who would be cheering for the demise of that person, right? Maybe, or I don't know, it feels that way. Back then, there were obviously people who were rooting for him not to make it, I assume. I just don't, I don't know how, I don't know how widespread. There was like, there was like rumors or I came across a story maybe where like students at like Yale or another school, maybe not Yale, like cheered, you know? But like, yeah. but it was just different. It was a different time. And like his approval rating skyrocketed and he won re-election like the law. He only lost DC and Minnesota yeah, in 1984, five, right? 525 to 13. Right. And so like, that'll never happen again, probably. Right. We're so poor. So, and so I think it was just different and I, I wasn't alive then. So I had to rely on the people who were, who covered this, like Luke Cannon and David Broder who had their pulse on this kind of thing. And and reading through it, like you really, there was kind of a you know, and and, and you got to remember at this point in time in American history, like there was malaise, right? Like people were America felt beat up from the seventies, and were we beating the Soviet Union or not? Like there was the whole you know what happened with the Iran the Iranian hostages, and like, it was a very difficult time, and and people felt like America had lost a step, and here was a guy. A cowboy whose Secret Service code name was Rawhide, right? <laughs> who, who, lo- you know, who, who, literally, it was like cracking jokes with a chest tube in his side, and like it's apparently very painful to have a chest tube in your side. And, you know, the other one that came out that I think is really reflective of Reagan's character, right? Like you can argue his politics. A lot of people don't like his politics. A lot of people don't like him, but like. When his wife shows up at the ER and she comes to see him, you know, do do we think that, you know, our leaders today or the leaders of like three or four years ago, when their wife came in to the to the ER, is there what would they be crying? Would they be lamenting their what happened to them, complaining, Um, you know? Or what Reagan did was he looked at his wife and cracked a joke. He said, honey, I forgot to duck. Right. Which reprises Jack Dempsey's line to his girlfriend when he got knocked out in a world championship fight. You know, he's like, I forgot to duck, you know, as yeah, a but joke. Gene Tunney. Yep. And and so like that. What does that tell you about Reagan is whose feelings are you? Is he worried about that moment? Who is he worried about? He's worried about Nancy Reagan. He's not worried about himself. He's been shot. He has a chest tube in his side. Everything's bloody around him. They're talking about wheeling to surgery. Finally, sees his wife. He's like, "Don't, honey, I forgot to duck. It'll be fine." You know, and like, would Trump do that? Biden do that? Would would Obama? I don't know. I, maybe. maybe. I, I don't I think. I think George W. Bush could have pulled that line out. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. Clinton's, like, Clinton's good with one liners. Of course, so is Barack maybe, Obama. Maybe with Biden, but I meant one. I guess I'm not worried about the one liner as much as in that moment, or or they, and maybe they are. But in that moment, are they thinking about themselves or are they concerned with empathy about the person across them? And that's what he was doing. He was more worried about, like, if I'm shot, I'm laying there and my wife comes in. Am I sobbing like I don't want to die? Or am I worried about calming her down because she's freaked out? Yeah, I don't know what the answer to that is because I haven't been shot. But I like that's revealing about someone's character, you know, and, and everyone knows what that means, what he's doing. And I don't know. I think that built a bond with the American public. You're listening to the Leaders and Legends podcast. We're talking to Dell Quentin Wilbur, 
author of Rawhide Down, The Near Assassination of Ronald Reagan. We have a few minutes left before we get to the five questions. Take us back to the scene at the Washington Hilton. What is happening while President Reagan is in the car and in the ER? Oh, so they round up, they get Hinckley, right? They grab Hinckley and they throw him, they throw Hinckley um, into a police car and take him to D.C. police headquarters where he's questioned um, pretty intensively. And they eventually, over the next, the truncated version, it's a very dramatic interrogation, but the truncated version is they eventually get him to admit that he did it for for Jodie Foster, right? They eventually get him to do that. It's, it's much more detailed than that. Um, and at the Hilton, too, they're they're treating three wounded men. Tom Delahanty gets rushed to Washington Hospital Center with a bullet wound to his back. The bullet's like right next to his spine. Um, Jim Brady's head, the bullet, he used um, these devastator bullets, which had like lead azide or something in the tip that explodes and it hit him in the forehead and like spread shrapnel everywhere in Jim Brady's brain. And he got taken to GW where um, Art Cobrine laboriously over like a lot of hours plucked those things out of his brain and saved his life. Like Brady was not, the, the odds were against Brady to make it, but he did because of Art Cobrine. And the, the surgeon and saved him by pulling those things out of his um the, the shrapnel on his brain if it had been a regular bullet however if it had been like a hollow point or a regular bullet brady's dead because what they didn't really understand they made these devastator bullets they sound so terrible they explode when they hit things that actually cuts out a lot of the kinetic energy from the bullet and it doesn't do as much damage right and so like it hit his forehead and exploded and it probably saved his life because it didn't do as much damage um, and then McCarthy was shot. It was near his liver. The bullet ended up near his liver and he was taken to surgery um, and eventually went and, and they they took the bullet out of him and he was fine. He was actually the first one discharged from the hospital. And he was really struggling as he was in the hospital with like PTSD stuff. Right. Like he got he wasn't wearing a vest. He got shot. It hurt a lot. You know. This whole thing was very traumatic for him. And as he's discharged, he learns that Reagan wants to see him. Well, of course he goes to see Reagan. And he has two little kids and his wife go up. And they're brought into the presidential suite at the... Reagan spent 11 days in the hospital, by the way. And you get to the presidential suite. And his kids are running around. And like one like almost yanks out like a tube from Reagan or something. And McCarthy's <laughs> like, oh, my God, guys, stop being idiots, you know? And but at the same time, Reagan can tell this is from McCarthy. Reagan can tell McCarthy's like not not really okay. And he looks at McCarthy and he goes, Agent McCarthy, I have a question. Uh, yes, Mr. President. McCarthy, Reagan, Delahanty, and Brady. What did this guy have against the Irish? <laughs> right? And and McCarthy starts to laugh. And he said, you know what, Del? Like I was like, I didn't, we didn't get PTSD trained or counseling or anything back then. He goes, but you know, I had this moment where I'm like, here's the president of the United States who was shot, almost died, barely lived. And he's put this behind him in his crack and jokes. You know, if he can do it, I can. Hmm. You know, he said that was a turning point for him. You know, and did McCarthy go back into the service? He detail? did. Protection? Yeah. And he, he led the detail, I believe, the president's detail at one point. And then he went to Chicago and led that office. And then he became um, a police chief for a suburban department in Illinois, suburban Chicago, Illinois. And Delahanty, how did the rest of his career go? He, he was medically re retired. He had to, re yeah, he was medically retired. He had to retire. He was done. He refuses interviews too. I tried to interview him. He refused. That's interesting. Okay. That and they he took would the refuse they, they actually removed the bullet the next after, like the day later, they removed the bullet from his back because mm -hmm. they were worried it was an explosive bullet. And they all like the doctors all wore like bulletproof vests and stuff when they removed the bullet from Delahanty. <laughs> and he just never talked about it with anyone? No, he just refused. Most of us know that that Jim Brady had an impact on American politics yeah. far beyond just press secretary. Yep. Him and his wife. Yep. Del, go ahead. Oh no, he, you know, they started the Brady Center for for, you know stricter measures to control um you know guns and who has access to firearms um and the brady center has been very influential in american politics and in fact 
I believe, in like, was it 92? It was before Reagan was diagnosed with Alzheimer's. I want to say it was 90, maybe 1991 or 92 that Reagan came out in favor of like gun control measures at Brady's. Wasn't it on the 10 year anniversary? Yeah, I think it was 1991. And he gave a speech at the hospital and he came out for a measure, which I was, I think that may have been the measure that eventually became the assault weapons ban, but don't hold me to that. Cause that was under Clinton, the assault weapons ban. Right. So like, I don't know what, and that was the Bush administration. So I don't know. But it was definitely he came out in favor of some measure of gun control, in part because of Brady's lobbying. Well, not Brady's lobbying, his wife's lobbying. Hinkley shoots the president of the United States <laughs> and, quote unquote, gets away with it. What were the ramifications of the verdict he received not guilty by reason of insanity? Well, they changed the rules. And so at that point in time, if you raised if you raised the defense, I'm insane. The prosecution then had the burden to prove you weren't. So the trial was the prosecutors trying to prove that he wasn't, that he was sane, and the defense trying to prove he was insane at the time. And they they sparred in court, but the burden of proof was on the prosecutors. That changed. The law was changed to the point in, uh, across the country that that level of proof then shifted to the defense. The defense had to prove someone was insane, not vice versa. Because I believe if they had had that level of proof during his trial, he would have he would not have been found not guilty by reason of insanity. Um, and, and Hinckley is out. He, he's out now. But the irony of this is that, you know, he was under close supervision at St. Elizabeth. He eventually got more and more freedom. And uh, a year or two ago, was it two years ago, a year or two ago, um, he was finally released full time. Uh, don't time has flown in COVID. So it's sure. like a little, a little it, was, well, it was a few years ago. I remember. Yeah. And so, you know, he's now free full time. In fact, you know, what's interesting. He's like trying to play gigs with his guitar and sell songs and make money. He has a Twitter account. Um, I asked to interview him and he didn't get back to me. He clearly didn't like the book. Um, But he. um, The irony is that, you know, if he had been convicted, he would have been released a lot earlier under the sentencing guidelines at place during that day. And so he would have been released. He He would have gotten like, you know. 20 to life or something he would have been released I, I bet he would have been released by 2010 maybe a little earlier from prison or maybe even like 2005 2001 i don't know i remember at one point i knew when he probably would have been released under the rules but he was kind of kept under supervision and close supervision until now where he's arthritic and can barely walk um or he has trouble walking because he's Did heavy, you? Like arthritis and so like he but you know he did change the law like the law is much harder now to claim insanity. Did you attempt to, and I've read several articles about her attitude about this entire incident. Did you try to interview Jodie Foster? Um, I don't remember. I don't think I bothered. Um, Cause she's she, only talked about it like two or three or four times. Yeah, and she usually dismisses interview requests. She's not interested. So I, I don't remember. I, I don't quite remember if I reached out to her or not. I probably did and then didn't get a response and didn't press it. I didn't. I went through Hinckley's attorney and asked if Hinckley wanted to talk. At that time, though, if he had talked, it would have been evidence that he had um, um, narcissism, which is part of like his diagnosis. And therefore, they wouldn't let him do any interviews. He was also precluded by court order, I believe, from doing interviews also. So it was kind of. Have, have you ever been to the Henry Ford Museum to see the Reagan I limousine? I did. I gave a talk there in front of that limousine. That very, and the Kennedy limousine are right next to each other. It's I know. haunting. It's, it is haunting. And then 100 feet away is the chair that Lincoln was sitting in. Oh, wow. That Henry Ford, he collected strange stuff. He had a, he had a lot of disposable income. Yes. We've reached the point in the Leaders and Legends podcast where we ask the same five questions of all of our guests. Del Quentin Wilmer, are you ready? Sure. What was your first job? reporter like first professional job or are you talking like first little job first job you got paid your own money um uh as a re- my sophomore year i guess my first real job if you don't count silly odd jobs um i was a reporter for the tampa tribune i was like i answered phones at the tampa tribune one summer in college what was your first concert oh man maybe like a version with my dad when i was little with the four tops of the 
or the Temptations, I believe, at Wolf Trap. Maybe there was a symphony in there. I don't remember. My first great, my first great concert, truly great concert that I had ever been to that changed the trajectory of my music loving life was I went to two Wilco shows in 1997 <laughs> at the Riv. I saw them back to back two nights in a row. And the last night they broke curfew, had the Jayhawks come on stage and the roadies and they played David Bowie. That was a great concert. Sorry, I did. I, I shifted the answer there. <laughs> You know, that's what reporters do. That's what I do to reporters when I'm answering their questions. So, yeah. you know, turn about. If you could suggest any book for someone to read, which book would you recommend? Rawhide Down. No, um, I'm sure. I would good. recommend Rawhide Down. It is a very, very good what, book. What? Um, what's a good book? Man, that's a tough one. I've read so many. Does it have to be one I've recently read? No, um, sir. That I liked, you know. So, you know, like the great Gatsby was really influential for me. Um, you know, I really liked um, the Shackle, the, Endur- the book Endurance about Shackleton's oh. adventure. Mm-hmm. That was a really influential book, narrative nonfiction. Friday Night Lights was really influential for me. The book Homicide by David Simon. I'm giving you too many. It's not fair to ask about one book. Um, recently, you know, I really liked, um, I can't pronounce his name. Um, he wrote the Hitler biography, like the rise and fall of the Third Reich. I really, Shire? really like that. Shire, Shire? Shire. Mm-hmm. That was a great book. But this guy, Ulbricht, oh, here, Ul- Ulrich, he wrote a two volume history of Hitler um, by Volker Ulrich. Um, and Ascent, the first one, I mean, was really, really, really good. Oh, and I guess, yeah, sorry, you, you don't start me on good books. Uh, Rick Atkinson's Army at Dawn. Army at Dawn, yeah. Prose, prose poetry. It was like, and there's a there's a scene I like. Like, he's brilliant. And in one of his later books, there's a scene where he's talking about um, not Patton, but one of the generals. On Hodges. The, no. Um, Bradley. Yeah, Omar Bradley. And he's talking about Bradley. He's giving Bradley's biography on the ship on the way to Normandy. And it's so brilliantly done. You could smell the ocean. You could hear the waves hit slapping the ship, it moving, all churning towards that beach. Meanwhile, he's giving you all the background about Bradley. And you don't even know you're learning all about Omar Bradley's life over like a thousand words. And then you're back on the ship. And like you'd never left the ship. And I've read that that section of that book nine or 10 times to understand how he did that. And I still don't understand it. Sorry, go ahead. Number four, this isn't much easier, sir. Forgive me. If you could witness any event in history, be there in person as it happens, which event would you choose? Uh, The night Lindbergh's son is kidnapped from his house because I'm writing a book about that right now for Simon & Schuster, the Lindbergh kidnapping. You're going to come back on and talk about it? Yes. But I would go back then to see what truly transpired at that house. I think I know what happened, but I would, that's right now, I know that'd be a waste of time. People might think, oh, I'd like to go see Jesus on the cross. I'd like to go to the Kennedy assassination, the Abraham Lincoln assassination, um, you know, the Oppenheimer setting the switch to launch, you know, set off the first nuclear bomb. I don't know, but I would go back to that uh, selfish reasons. For my Hopman, guilty or innocent? Guilty. Absolutely. Last question. If you could have dinner with anyone living today, two hours off the record just to chat, whom would you choose? Anyone living today? Nah, that's, that's a really, really hard one. Living today? Um, yes, sir. The problem is, as a reporter, you get access to a lot of people that like you would put on that list that you may not get. Living today? I don't know. Um, you interviewed Sofia Vergara? Well, we're going to go down that road. I think we're not, <laughs> uh, not getting me in trouble. Um, who would I want two hours with? That would just be cool. Um, uh, Rick Atkinson. No, I mean, I can do that on my own. I'm trying like someone I couldn't get without a wish. Right. Like you want like who could I who couldn't I get without a wish? Maybe like a J.D. Salinger or someone. Is he still alive? I don't think so. I think he I thought he was still alive. Kurt Vonnegut. I don't know. Some hard to get author who's like a recluse that like no one has talked to in a really long time. You know what? You know who I do it? You know, who I'd get this is who I'd get dinner with. 
I would get dinner with whoever was Satoshi Nakamoto, the mysterious man who created Bitcoin. There's a he has a he has a million Bitcoin in a wallet he's never touched that he created. And that's worth like a billion dollars. And he just vanished. And that's not even his real name. But I would take a two hour dinner with that guy so I could get his story and tell it. That's what I would do. You have been listening to Leaders and Legends, a podcast presented by Veteran Strategies, an Indiana-based public relations enterprise, and sponsored by Garmon Construction, Leaders and Legends LLC, the Grand Hall and Conference Center at Historic Union Station, the McGinley's Golden Ace Inn, and Maca- excuse me, and NFP, a national insurance broker with strong local content. Our guest today has been Del Quentin Wilbur, author of Rawhide Down, The Near Assassination of Ronald Reagan. We should mention, however, that Del's grandfather may be the only undefeated Major League Baseball manager in history. (laughs) One and zero. For the Texas Rangers, taking over for Whitey Herzog, right? Right That's right. And and the, the one they hired to replace him was that crazy New York Yankees manager. Billy Martin. Billy Martin. See, thank you, Dale. Baby brain. I know that stuff. And I just, <laughs> You'll be thinking about you. this at 3 a.m. when you're doing that feeding. But oh, I know. I got to do it. I got to read this book again. All right. You man. have thank been you a much. terrific guest. Your book is wonderful. And we're very, very lucky for you to come on the podcast. I enjoyed it. It was fun. Thank you. Thank you very much for listening to Leaders and Legends, brought to you by Veteran Strategies Incorporated. If you want to contact us about this program or our menu of public relations services, please send us an email at robert at veteranstrategies.com. That's robert at veteranstrategies.com. This podcast was produced and edited by Chris Spangle and Leaders and Legends, LLC. If you're interested in starting a podcast or taking yours to the next level, please contact us at leadersandlegends.net.